Good evening, everyone. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Studley Graduate Program in International Affairs and the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School. I'm Shiba Tejani, and I'm a faculty member in the International Affairs Program. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you here today, uh, old friends, new faces, uh, and I'm looking forward to a stimulating discussion this evening. I'm especially pleased and honored to host our distinguished panelists who will talk to us today about women's work from their long intellectual engagement on the subject, their political advocacy, and their vast policy experience. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment uh, to introduce the Studley Graduate Program. Uh, the SGPIA is a critical and interdisciplinary program of international and global affairs, very much in the new school tradition. Apart from having a particularly active and engaged student body, our program has faculty with, ex uh, with expertise in a wide variety of fields, such as human rights, development, crit critical international political economy, urban affairs, humanitarianism, security studies, and global governance. Please visit our website to learn more about our program. Uh, Teresa Gilarducci, Irene and, Bola and Bernard L. Schwartz, Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research and Director of the Schwartz Center for Economic, Anal uh, for Economic Policy Analysis, is also uh, co-hosting this event, and I ask her to say a few words about SIPA before we begin. <clears throat> Thank you, Shiva. Um, I am Teresa Gilarducci. I'm the Director of the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. And why we um, co-sponsored this event and why we exist is pretty interesting. We are the policy arm of the Department of Economics um, at the New School, where Shiva got her PhD. We're so proud of you. Um, and um, we are a center um, within the department that seeks to make um, heterodox economics, critical economics, part of mainstream policy making. Um, so we uh, have a self-conscious goal and commitment to connect our heterodox um, economic theory and frameworks into the world in which we live and to make that a better world. Um, I also um, want to shout out to Sheba um, and announce that we, the Department of Economics just um, two weeks ago, um, Sheba and everyone, um, has made official a um, qualifying in a field exam in feminist economics. So finally, finally, um, it is part of our, our normal course of our curriculum. So thank you very much for coming. This is an amazing panel. Many people I have not seen for a while, and thank you so much for coming here. And thank you, Shiva. Thank you, Teresa. So now to the question of why we are here tonight. This event has been provocatively and deliberately titled Work as Emancipation or Emancipation from Work in order to highlight the persistent emphasis in academic policy and even activist circles on labor force participation as a strategy for women's economic empowerment. No doubt, economic independence, i.e. having an income and being able to control it, has often afforded women the ability to make decisions about their own lives, to achieve a degree of autonomy and control over their futures, to exit abusive relationships and gain more equality within the home. But has this emphasis on work as emancipation gone too far? We know that poor women from the South, as well as black women and minority women in the North, have always worked excessively long hours, often in conditions where the nature of work is degrading, hazardous, and poorly paid, with few prospects for advancement. A new paper in the American Economic Review finds that the average hours spent on market work per week per adult is greater by nine and a half hours in low income countries as compared to high income countries. For women, it's greater by 10 hours, not counting the additional work spent working at home. Uh, sorry, the additional hours spent working at home. Combined with the higher average pay workers and in high income countries receive, the paper concludes that, quote, aggregate productivity and welfare differences across countries are larger than currently thought. And that, quote, residents of the poorest countries are not only consumption poor, but leisure poor as well. In addition to market work, women do two and a half times more care and unpaid work at home on average. So many women are working a double or even triple day. At the same time, the rapid rise of robotic technologies and artificial intelligence points to an increasingly jobless future, especially in some export and service industries where women tend to be clustered. 
How do we think about these changes going forward? Can we imagine alternative paths to economic empowerment that recognize women's invisible labor? What role does the state and policies such as a universal basic income and social protection play in this regard? Is it possible to reimagine work as an aesthetic and creative category rather than simply a category of capitalist production? With that, I would like to introduce our learned panelists and invite them to share their thoughts on these questions. Julie Nelson is a professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and senior research fellow at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University. Her research interests include feminist economics, ecological economics, economic methodology, and ethics and economics. She has authored many articles in journals range, ranging from e uh, Econometrica to Hypatia, Journal of Feminist Philosophy, authored a number of books, including Economics for Humans, uh, soon coming out in a second edition, and co-edited uh, co with Marianne Ferber, Beyond Economic Man, Feminist Theory and Economics, published in 1993, which is a classic. Shahra Razavi is the chief of the research and data section at UN Women, where she is research director of UN Women's flagship report, Progress of the World's Women. She specializes in the gender dimensions of development with a particular focus on work, social policy, and care. Her recent publications include Seen, Heard, and Counted, Rethinking Care in a Development Context, an article in Development and Change, and Underpaid and Overworked, a cross-national perspective on care workers with Silky Staub in the International uh, Labor Review. Prior to joining UN Women, Shara was a, re uh, was a, sen well, sorry, Shara was a senior researcher at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development and visiting professor at the Interdisciplinary Center for Gender Studies at the Universities of Bern and Freiburg. Marina Durano is currently a program officer with the Women's Rights Program of the Open Society Foundations, creating a grant-making portfolio that will strengthen economic justice for women. She has spent more than 15 years strengthening women's political engagement with macroeconomic policies and global economic governance structures alongside uh, DAWN or Development Alternatives uh, with Women for a New Era and the International Gender and Trade Network. Along with Professor Geeta Sen, she released in 2014 an edited volume entitled The Remaking of Social Contracts, Feminist in a Fierce New World, published by Z Books for DAWN. Uh, this book received the uh, 2014 Outstanding Book Award from the National Academy for Science and Technology in the Philippines. Diane Elson is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Essex, UK, and a research associate at the Center for Women's Global Leadership, Rutgers University. She is a member of the UN Committee for Development Policy and advisor to UN Women. She is a former vice president of the International Association for Feminist Economics and active in the UK Women's Budget Group, a network of academics, policy analysts, and activists that scrutinize UK government budgets for their impact on gender inequality and women's rights. She was awarded the Leontief Prize for Advancing Frontiers of Economic Thought by the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University in 2016. She has published widely on gender equality and economic policy, including articles in numerous referee journals, and her recent books include Human Rights and the Capabilities Approach, uh, with, uh, edited with none other than Sakiko Fukudapar and uh, P. Vizad, and this was published in 2012, and another more recent book called Rethinking Economic Policy for Social Justice, co-authored with Radhika Balakrishnan and James Hines, and published in, 20, uh, in 2016. So with this, I invite uh, Julie to start us off. Thank you. Uh, I would understand if you might feel a moment of panic seeing four people who are used to talking a lot all on a panel that starts at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, we're not going to go past midnight. We're not going to get up here and talk. We were all uh, given the um, description of this and told to talk for a few minutes, maybe 15 max, and then hopefully there will be some discussion going. So um, I looked at the description of uh, this panel, and so I'm reacting to a certain uh, few things in there. Um, work as emancipation or emancipation from work. Um, I would actually argue for redefining and revamping work uh, rather than emancipation from work. The thing that I most noticed in uh, uh, the description was the discussions, um, allusions to discussions about the future of work that advocate universal basic income, uh, particularly in countries of the North. Uh, there's lots of other allusions in here that others on the panel can speak to much more, uh, but that's the, uh, the thing that got to me. And as I've 
look at discussions of universal basic income in northern countries, I've been disturbed by what seem to me to be three sexist assumptions that are often in there. Um, so I'm going to describe those assumptions and let that be the uh, uh, basis for my talk. Uh, first sexist assumption is that work is going away. Um, from the description of the program, said the rapid rise of robotic and AI technologies threaten future job creation. Uh, we all know that self-driving vehicles are coming very fast. Robotic factories uh, have existed for a while, increasing even more. Robots and surgery, you know, lots of other things like that going on. Now, this program also uh, talks about women's invisible work. Uh, and usually, invisible work is also unpaid work. So there is an acknowledgment there that women are doing unpaid, uh, caring work. But what I think still gets often missed in the discussion is the high volume of necessary paid caring work uh, that goes on. Uh, Nancy Fulbright and I wrote a paper together called uh, For Love or Money or Both uh, some time ago, in which we crunched some numbers, which I've, I've just updated here. Um, but we divided the economy into three big sectors, uh, manufacturing, transportation, utilities, construction, agriculture, and mining, okay, all the heavy lifting stuff. Um, uh, health, what, a sector we called personal services, health, education, social services, and personal services, daycare, hospitals, nurses, all kinds of schools, um, and then other services as the third category. In 1900, uh, manufacturing, transportation, et cetera, was about 68% uh, of workers worked in that sector, uh, only about 13% in the care services uh, sector. Uh, by 1990, that had gotten much closer. Uh, manufacturing, uh, transportation, et cetera, down to about 28%. Uh, health, education, other uh, caring services, up to about 22%. Uh, recent years, it has flipped. Um, health, education, social, and personal care services now employ more than manufacturing, transportation, agriculture, you know, all of the stuff stuff. So now about 25.1% of employment is in care services, 24.8% uh, in transportation, manufacturing, all of those things. You notice that adds up to about 50%. The other 50% is other services, financial services, retail, wholesale, all the rest of that. Um, so when you think of the typical worker in the US economy, it is not the manufacturing worker. It is not the truck driver. Okay? Uh, it may very well be the nurse, the teacher, uh, the person, uh, daycare worker uh, are much larger. And yet when we hear about AI and robotics, um, I think the possibilities of AI and robotics are much uh, narrower uh, in the realm of personal care services, at least if we uh, try to keep them humane and we know what we're doing. <laughs> um, yes, you could put a baby next to a, a, a heating pad wrapped in a terry cloth blanket, but it's not really going to be like a warm person, okay? Um, so uh, lots of education. We know there's big pushes for online education and efficiency in higher education. Um, I think there's a vital need for pushback on that because there are some things for which the human aspect is much harder to replace. Uh, and of course, there's a gender aspect to that. All of that moving around stuff occupations were traditionally male occupations. Um, uh, education and healthcare still disproportionately employ uh, women. Now suppose uh, we have a universal basic income program, and one of the big arguments for it is that people then don't ha are not forced to work for low wages. Well, right now, childcare work is one of the worst paid uh, occupations in the country. Uh, you can make more as a parking lot attendant, watching cars, than you can watching children. So what happens if there's universal basic income without taking care of revaluing care work, paying it right, making sure it's of high quality, and doing a whole lot of investments in that sector? If you just put in UBI without cleaning up that sector and make it worth working in, um, you put care back on women and families. Okay, there, the uh, paid care sector uh, disappears. So that's not, you know, there could still be reasons for doing UBI, but that's certainly something that one would uh, want to think about. At least you'd want to fix the care sector before uh, uh, knocking the, the legs out under um, uh, underpaid care work. Uh, the second, so uh, first the idea that work is disappearing. I think there's a lot of work that won't be disappearing very soon. Uh, second one is um, an assumption in a lot of UBI proposals that the adult individual is the appropriate unis, unit of analysis. 
I looked on Wikipedia, and its main definition says that UBI uh, payments are to every adult citizen. Uh, children get a message uh, uh, mentioned several paragraphs down in that article. And it seems like a lot of the discussions go along that way, that you know, the only relevant people are uh, adult citizens. Um, and I think this, this um, uh, is one of the reasons why some UBI uh, proposals have had support from right, the right wing. Milton Friedman proposed a negative income tax was similar uh, to a UBI. Um, but I think it's precisely because it creates uh, an excuse for members of society to stop caring about each other in terms of government programs, right? A lot of the argument for UBI is, okay, there's no more means testing, you don't have to prove you're disabled, we'll just give you the money, okay? But does anybody really believe that everyone's needs would be met with a kind of payment that goes uh, to everyone? What if you're disabled? What if you have a disabled child, okay? That same payment that's good for that every adult citizen that's perhaps imagined as someone who um, is self-sufficient is not going to work for those folks. I don't think you're going to get around uh, those. So I mean, in feminist economics, we long ago pointed out that this image of the autonomous um, actor is a very masculine one, uh, uh, independent, autonomous, self-interested person. In feminist economics, we've noticed that people are both individual and related, and that we're connected uh, in part by our needs for and abilities to give care. Um, so a UBI program that starts out by neglecting everything about care, everything about dependence, uh, comes in under immediate uh, suspicion uh, to me. Um, so again, and so I would like to see uh, you know, work redefined and re revamped. I would prefer to see proposals that uh, make childcare widely available and affordable, uh, pay parental leave in the U.S., no-brainer, we're the only industrialized country that doesn't do it, um, strengthen uh, net networks of elder care support, uh, get health care disconnected from employment. There's a lot of things we could do to provide support uh, for workers, for families, um, for people who are not working, <laughs> but that are tailored to actual needs, not to some mythical um, autonomous adult uh, citizen. And the third um, thing that I think is a sexist myth, and it's probably surprising, and be surprising particularly to some people in this audience, is the assumption um, that working for pay is, de is necessarily demeaning and exploitative under capitalism. Um, I think this comes up a lot in some of the UBI uh, discussions. Or in this phrase, um, you know, work as emancipation or emancipation from work. The idea of emancipation from work is often phrased as emancipation from wage slavery that if you're working for a wage, you are selling something intrinsic about yourself in order to get that wage. And of course, work as emancipation, I don't know if this is intended or not, but I immediately reading that phrase thought about the you know, sign over the Nazi death camps, work will make you free. Okay, clearly we don't want that kind of work can make you free. <laughs> um, uh, but emancipation from work, is it really always uh, wage slavery? Um, I would argue that it's not, and one of the reasons that we have failed to notice that, again, comes back to um, some basic sexism and sexist thinking. Uh, we have gotten very ingrained in our thinking, the idea that uh, markets, capitalism, uh, the economy, is this masculine, uncaring sort of realm. And it's usually contrasted since Victorian days with a more feminine, caring um, uh, realm, uh, home and community. Um, this kind of bothered me because a lot of people, um, there, were, there were a number of, of academics and theorists who even are a little bit suspicious about paid caring work. I mean, if you get money into a caring relationship, doesn't it somehow corrupt it? Um, and there's even people that argue that, that caring work should, should be paid little so any, only altruists take the job, okay? So this is even more, more brain dead. Um, what you, I think the way of getting past this is to notice that money is not just about greed. Okay, you have to kind of get out of a certain rut um, that, uh, of, of sort of anti-capitalist thinking about that in terms of um, uh, money is not, not uh, uh, associated, identical with greed. Um, and also that uh, if feminist economists started out critiquing um, economic models, we started with the model of the household. Single utility function comes to a maximum, everything, everybody acts as one. Okay, clearly that one needed unpacking. Um, not very many other feminist economists besides me so far have unpacked the model of the firm. One big organization, everybody just maximizes profits, right? You know, maybe that one needs just as much unpacking. 
Um, if we think that firms only maximize profit, they're only about greed, they have a perfect excuse when they do something greedy and awful to say, well, the system made me do it. Economists just tell us that's the way economies work. Uh, I don't think they always have to. I think a redefining and revamping can go on uh, in the kind of uh, world that we're in. Uh, I think uh, capitalist firms have, in general, offered women a very mixed bag in terms of uh, both opportunities and exploitations. And our task uh, should be to make sure that we do more good uh, uh, than harm. Um, I don't want to go on too long here, so let me just uh, I think we need a revamping of work to make it part of a mutually supportive social fabric. Uh, we need to put emphasis on the quality of work relationships uh, to make them non-exploitative. And uh, we need serious social and economic support for the work of care, both paid and unpaid. Now, these kinds of supports could include cash payments, uh, but I hope people don't get caught in the uh, capitalist slavery versus universal basic income and robot utopia um, uh, dualism that I sometimes see this literature falling into. Thank you. OK. Um, first of all, I want to thank Shiba for the invitation. When I uh, got the invitation from Shiba, I didn't know who the other co-panelists would be. And just by reading the description of the panel, I thought it was very provocative and really exciting. And had I known who my co-panelists are, I would not even have thought about it as long as I did to say, yes, I would love to be there. Um, so it is a great pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for that invitation. Um, I want to start, I mean, I, I'm, there are four points I really want to make. One, I'm going to start with trying to look at this whole notion of work as emancipation and see why, among feminists, this is something that has some purchase. Then I'm going to look very briefly at what was in your description, the whole thing of economic empowerment, which I will say is a very woolly and ambiguous concept, even though um, it has got a lot of uh, resonance, it seems. And then I want to just say a few words about the, third, the second part of the title, Emancipation from Work. Not necessarily talking about basic income, but talking about different kinds of social protection programs that already exist and how we may want to think about it. Um, so I don't really have, I only have a few slides that I'm going to show with my PowerPoint. So just on the first part, work as emancipation. Now, I think there is a long tradition within feminist thinking that has talked about work, paid work, being emancipatory. And I think um, we, we kind of often cite what uh, Joan Robinson what said, that the misery of being exploited by capitalists is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all. Um, and I think that has some resonance among feminists. Socialist feminists in particular, the tradition of socialist feminism, placed a lot of emphasis on the importance of uh, women's paid employment, uh, the vocabulary of you know, social production, and, that it ha and, and while highlighting the very adverse conditions under which women worked, the adverse health conditions, the gender uh, pay gaps, um, the insecurity of employment, etc. However, for many feminists, uh, the critical issue here was the extent to which participation in paid work really afforded women, or didn't, um, a degree of freedom from familial dependence. I think that's what really made paid work seem like emancipation. The extent to which it would allow a degree of freedom, a room for maneuver within familial dependence. Um, I think that, that's really important. Now, someone like Diana Wolf, uh, who was an anthropologist writing about family dynamics in the midst of structural transformation in Java, uh, for example, in her book on factory daughters, that's what she emphasized. These factory daughters, they were working under terrible conditions, but it gave them you know, a little bit of voice and a little bit, a little bit more room for maneuver uh, when it came to postponing a marriage or having a bit more voice in terms of how money needed to be spent on their own personal needs. Similarly, um, Naila Kabir has done um, a very interesting research in South Asia, in Bangladesh in particular, similarly making arguments about the way in which paid work and a wage can, within very patriarchal, uh, hierarchical family contexts, give women as daughters or whether as wives a bit more room for maneuver within, um, within that uh, familial context. Um, Valentine Moratam, also working on the Middle East, has similarly emphasized the ways in which uh, female labor force participation in that particular context, where it's very low, uh, could be a kind of um, 
could give women a bit of um, independence within a context where even legally uh, women are supposed to obey husbands because they're supported and provisioned by their husbands. So it's very much a male breadwinner model that is actually coded within a family laws. I think what these perspectives all shared was a focus on how paid work could alter the kind of intimate relations, familial relations of women's subordination. You know, that's, that's really what it was about. And give women access to the public arena, a bit more uh, mobility and visibility in the, in, in, in the public arena, possibilities of having networks that go beyond kinship and family, uh, maybe um, uh, you know, uh, forms of collective mobilization, and maybe a different identity, identities as workers, uh, uh, the exploitative conditions notwithstanding. And I think while some uh, here would see this as an outcome, i.e. the liberation from familial domination as, a, as an automatic up outcome of uh, doing work in factories, uh, Diane Elson actually, in a very classic uh, article in 1981 with Ruth Pearson, uh, had a much more open-ended view and, and what they argued was that the incorporation of women into wage work can be expected to decompose existing forms of gender subordination, but the degree to which actually this happens or it's recomposed will be determined both by the outcome of the struggle between women workers and capital as well as their relationships of women to uh, men and to others within their families, within their kinship systems, and um, within their communities. Um, and that this really, I think this was a verdict that still stands you know, um, the, quite strong. And, and that relationship is not a given. It needs to be really empirically um, kind of questioned and, and scrutinized. And the point about women's access to paid work acting as a bulwark against patriarchal family arrangements was not just something that happened and was discussed in developing countries. It was also a very kind of prominent issue in feminist critiques of um, welfare regimes, for example. Um, here I'm thinking in particular of the way in which feminists challenged the notion of citizenship that rested on this idea of decommodification, which was very central to Esping Anderson's work on the, uh, the, the three worlds of welfare, welfare capitalism. What people like Anne Orloff and um, Diane Sainsbury and others pointed out was that for many women who were uh, excluded from paid work, commodification, in fact, i.e. obtaining a position in the paid labor force was potentially emancipatory. You know, exactly the same point that many of the other feminists working in developing countries were saying. And Anne Orloff, to quote from her directly, she said, many women want paid work because it provides independence and enhanced leverage within marriage and patriarchal family. But Orloff then went on, I think, to do something which is really, really useful as we push this debate sort of forward. She proposed this concept of what she called defamiliarization. If decommodification is important because it frees people from, uh, it frees wage earners from compulsion of participating in the market, as people like Esping Anderson and others were arguing, similar to what some of these basic income advocates would be saying, what she said was that a parallel dimension is needed to indicate the ability of those who do, uh, do most of the domestic and caring work, predominantly women, to form and maintain their own autonomous households that is to survive and support their children or whoever else they may have as dependents and themselves without having to marry or to enter partnerships and to gain access to breadwinner income. So I think this is an important um, criteria to keep in mind. And so moving on to economic empowerment, which is where I think we lost uh, a lot of what was very important and um, useful in the earlier discussion on, on emancipation from work that feminists had engaged in. Um, um, was, um, you know, some of that was lost, as I will say. I think in recent years, we've seen a wide range of actors, you know, international organizations in particular, the corporate sector uh, also embracing this notion of women's economic empowerment. And I think in the process of doing so, not only has the concept of empowerment kind of become very fluffy and um, um, vague, but also we kind of have lost the critical focus on capitalism, as well as the way in which uh, that sort of capitalist system interacts with patriarchal relations within families. So we lost a lot of that systemic view and systemic thinking that was there earlier. 
And now some see in women uh, largely, as, um, they see them as an only uh, untapped consumer market. So it's you know, good for growth, it's good for profits, et cetera, you know, the bottom of the pyramid. If women have their own income, then we can get a bigger consumer market. Um, while others, you know, like the McKenzie Institute, have all these um, projections that show it, if more women enter the labor force, you know, growth will expand by you know, exponentially and so on. But a fundamental question that needs to be asked is whether these win-win scenarios actually stand up to scrutiny, and what is in it for women? Um, does it expand women's enjoyment of their rights, um, uh, and different, different rights? And does it allow, to go back to Anne Orloff, that kind of defamiliarization? Does working for pay in these kind of markets that we now have, very under-regulated, does it actually allow women to, to, to form and support their own autonomous households? Or is it just harnessing their time and energy and resourcefulness to serve capital accumulation and growth and et cetera, whatever else is supposed to be um, the outcome of that. So I think for that it would be good to sort of I'll move on to the third part of what I want to say um, in the quest for defamiliarization. Are we, where are we? Are we actually there? And a few sort of a reality check I think on that would be useful. Now I do want to sort of bring in a bit of a global focus here and not just uh, a focus on developed countries to see really the extent to which uh, women's labor force participation uh, captures commodification in the sense that is implied by the term, i.e. at least having a, a monetary income, and whether it's in any ways liberating from family, family, sort of patriarchal family structures and enabling of a kind of um, defamiliarization, the ability to really support your own household. Now, first of all, in many developing countries, especially those with very big rural, rural hinterlands, a significant proportion of women who do work, work as unpaid family workers. And here I'm not referring to care work. Even the work that is counted as uh, economic within uh, calculations of GDP, uh, within the system of national account, much of that work does not give them a wage or an income. It's working on a family farm or a family enterprise. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, about 40% of women who are in the workforce, this is in the labor force as it's counted by ILO, for example, they're classified as contributing family workers uh, with no income of their own. And um, uh, even in Latin America, a much more urbanized you know, continent, in countries such as Bolivia and Peru, again, this type of employment continues to be the norm for about more than 50% of women, of rural women, which means that they receive no direct income from their work and are often actually working within a structure, a family farm or family business, where, again, they're under the supervision of a um, male household head, a father, a husband, etc. But secondly, when we also shift to developed countries and the high-income countries, the commodification of women's uh, labor and the ability to actually work for an income is differentiated by wealth. And I think um, if, if we could have the, the next one, which is the first figure. Yeah, I don't know how clearly you can see this, but what this shows is um, these are different uh, clusters of countries. Um, uh, on the left, we have the... Um, these are the, uh, Nordic, the Nordic countries. Yeah, yeah. So there we have the uh, Nordic countries, um, continental European, Central and Eastern Europe, here Anglo Saxon, US, UK, Australia, etc., Mediterranean, and Latin America. And the more vertical this line is, here you have quintiles. So the poorest women and the richest from the poorest house. Possibility of commodification or being in, having an income of their own is higher. Um, is more or less the same, but still it has an, uh, a gradient showing that lower income households have less, women from lower income households are having less possibilities of working for pay. That's basically what this is capturing. And where we see in Anglo-Saxon and Latin America and in Southern European countries, there's a big class difference. So it's often those who come from higher income households, and we can in the discussion talk a bit more about that, um, what is actually causing this correlation. Um, but generally having higher education levels, having services, um, possibilities of uh, buying ready-made substitutes for their care work, etc., that enables women in higher income households to go out and work, whereas often those who have a, a large burden of social reproduction having to do and not being able to either um, get in a childcare worker or use a crash or a, a facility for childcare, those are the ones who have difficulties commodifying their labor. So it's not something which is equal 
equally experienced by all women, even in the developed countries. But even in high-income countries where increasing proportions of women are working for pay throughout their lives, they are still not necessarily financially independent. And I think this is something which is really important to emphasize. And if we can have the next figure, what the or just looking at the orange figures there, this captures the proportion of the couple income that women bring in. Even in the Nordic countries, it's you know at best about... Um, sort of 45, uh, 40%, but for many other countries, it's more like 30% or less in the other regions. And that's quite interesting when we think about, you know, being able to really be financially autonomous or not. Even when they're working women throughout their lives, you know, something like 30% of couple income is brought in by women. And much more telling in terms of whether we have defamilialization or not is the fact that when women are living in uh, single mother households, their poverty rates are huge. And this you know, is for every country, this is from the Luxembourg Income Study. The highest rate of poverty among single mother households is in the US, South Africa, also Spain, uh, Luxembourg, a few other countries. So finally, let me, so this really I think does kind of question the extent to which even in high income countries, we've achieved anything close to defamiliarization and the capacity for women to maintain their own autonomous households without being penalized financially and in terms of poverty. So not, not, we're not there yet. And finally, let me move on to this whole notion of emancipation from work and in terms of what um, is on offer currently in terms of the social protection system, short of a basic income grant that is universal and everyone gets, which you know, we can discuss the pros and cons of it, and I think um, Julie has already raised some really important points um, in terms of not being convinced by it. Now, I think much of the appeal of employment as a route to social citizenship was premised on a kind of social security system that gave women a lot of women and men, once you joined the workforce, a lot of rights that came with it. Rights to health care, to a pension, I mean, that was the ideal. Of course, that ideal, um, even for men in many countries, was never real. But at least in the, uh, you know, there was this notion that at least even in developing countries, if you were working in the public sector, you would have some of these uh, sort of uh, benefits that came with paid work. And that made paid work in many ways very attractive for many women who would see teaching and nursing profession in many of our countries, actually, that was a route to upward mobility for women of at least my mother's generation. Uh, and now in the era of labor precarity, a lot of those social rights have fallen off and increasingly eroded because the nature of employment has changed and has become more sort of non-standard employment, as the ILO calls it, in both high-income and low-income countries. And it is in this context of under-regulated labor markets that millions of people are sort of the working poor. And I think we need to think much more, um, uh, not just in terms of contingencies such as, you know, being um, maternity or being sick or very old, but also while you're working, you need some kind of income security because paid work is not sufficient. So this, I think, leaves a room for other kinds of social protection. And there has been quite, in, in developing countries in particular, quite a bit of progress in terms of expansion of social assistance programs, which I would argue that we need to build on rather than kind of uh, throw out some of what has been achieved. And to give you just a, a, a few glimpses of what has been achieved, social assistance programs are making a difference for many women in, in many parts of the developing world, particularly in the La uh, Latin America region, where they did expand quite significantly um, over the past decade, since uh, the early 2000s. Uh, for example, we see in the next slide, um, sorry, this one, yeah. Yeah, where here are a proportion of women who have, uh, who don't have an income of their own, and the orange dots are for women. And what you see is over the past 12 years, there's a, a significant uh, decrease in the proportion of women who have no income of their own. This is 15 years and older. And much of this, this is coming from ECLAC, this counts social assistance payments. It's not a huge payment, but some of this is due to the conditional cash transfers that have become and have spread quite significantly to countries in the region, giving women some income of their own. It's not huge, but there is some income. And also in the next slide, this is for women who are 
60 years and above. So these are women who are receiving what are called social pensions. Again, social pensions are a kind of social assistance as opposed to a contributory system where you have to be in the labor force to get it. So again, from 32% women with no income of their own in 2002, we're down to about 18%. But of course, there are huge problems because the benefit levels of social pensions are varied and in some contexts quite low, quite meager. Uh, and the adequacy of social pension is a major source of concern. And the same can be said about the conditional cash transfers that are given to mothers when they have children in the household. Um, and again, the size of those and the generosity of those transfers is low. And this is something that I think needs to be sort of rethought and um, um, there's a case to be made for making them more generous, but also with the conditional cash transfers, there's been a huge literature critiquing the kind of conditionalities that are attached and also the means testing that excludes a lot of women. But I would say we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, and rather than chasing a basic income grant, which is um, a bit, um, I think there are many questions to be asked about it, uh, I think more can be done. There are good arguments for remo removing some of these conditionalities, for um, removing the means test, and making child benefits, for example, universal, given the fact that women are predominantly the ones who live with and care for children, and we have data showing this, and often penalized uh, in material terms. Uh, we know poverty rates globally are very high in all countries in households with children, and very often those who are with children um, are women. So universal child benefits. Uh, would be something that I think would be very desirable. And the universality of it is really important so as not to exclude women who are not living in um, uh, 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 poor households, i.e. those who are in non-poor households would then also have some level of benefit um, when, you make it, when you make this universal. A universal child benefit ensures an independent source of income for women, I think in a way that cannot be reproduced by a kind of income-tested or means-tested uh, type of benefit, uh, which would depend on a, couple, on a couple's joint income, which would exclude um, you know, many women who live in non-poor households. And at the same time, I think such benefits should be complemented with, of course, very importantly, investments in infrastructure in many poor countries that reduce the drudgery of unpaid work Work, uh, fetching water, etc., but also um, the investment in care services that would uh, make it possible for many women to have the preconditions, you know, for those women where, you know, in low income households who cannot afford market based childcare services, public services would make it possible for them to redistribute some of their care work and have an income of their own by, um, by being, um, you know, in, in paid work. It, in a way, it would provide the preconditions for uh, women's paid work. And even with a reformed social security system that I think leans towards universalism, labor market earnings will be both necessary uh, for an adequate standard of living um, as we move forward, but and also for many women it will be desirable. And I would totally endorse what was just said about the fact that despite all the talk of robotics, we know that there are huge needs for care and it's a growing uh, sector of employment, not only in the US, but, but globally. And there's a lot of potential for meeting human needs and making this sector an engine for employment generation. So I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, okay, well, um, you know, when I, I saw the panel, um, Sheba had uh, sent to me the description, then I saw, I already knew who was going to be there. I think I was the last person invited. <laughs> and I said, oh, great, I don't have to say anything. Uh, they, they'll take care of it. <laughs> so so when I, I looked at the title, I thought, oh, uh, immediately switched to my uh, language. And in, in, in Tagalog language, uh, the, the, which is, you know, where I'm from the Philippines, um, the word for work is actually a compound noun. Okay, so it's made up of two words, uh, hanap, H-A-N-A-P, meaning search, and buhay, B-U-H-A-Y, meaning life. So it's interesting that in, <laughs> in my language, uh, work is hanap buhay or search life. And I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe I can work from there, you know, and actually ask the question, what does this all mean to talk about emancipation from work or work as emancipation if we understood work as a search for life, right? So, so uh, the thing is, uh, I don't have the philosophy of uh, our, our, our people, but I thought, okay, let's play around with this anyway. You know, is... Uh, um, Hanap buhay, can that represent 
work that is about emancipation, right? Uh, and, and then asking ourselves, okay, under what conditions would that then be possible for, for the search for life <laughs> to be found in, in, by working? You know, I suspect that my translation of Hanap Buhay to work may be incorrect. Probably the correct English word is more occupation in the sense, not of profession, but uh, what occupies your time. You know, what do you do? You know, uh, what are your activities? How do you spend your day? Uh, that might be the closer approximation to the notion of Hanap Buhay, which Strangely, we don't. We really only refer to occupation as professions. We don't think of occupation as, yeah, you know, the whole set of activities that we do. You know, whether it's uh, licensed or not, it doesn't matter. But anyway, um, um, not here to discuss that. This is not a treatise on on, on philosophy, uh, and and I only was intrigued, and I thought this could be an interesting starting point. And even more interesting is if we think think about emancipation from work. We really need to. The other, the opposite is bondage. You know, where are we emancipating ourselves from? What is is the question? What were the bonds that we needed to break free from? Um, and I think we already heard a little bit of that from Julie and, and, and Shara. You know, if work was emancipation, what was the bondage? Under what conditions can work be emancipation? Perhaps some work is emancipation. It becomes a vehicle for the search of life. And, and this is really my question rather than a statement. Uh, and so we have to then ask the question, what kind of life? right? Um, because life can be mere survival. Um, that is to stay alive. You know, and one can think of settings of conflict or war, in which case, what is work in that situation? And we do have to think about that. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, work is not this New York City. There's many kinds of work and many settings for work. Uh, what about, um, or are we talking about life in the sense of, say, cap the capabilities approach for Amartya Sen, you know, life of flourishing, of becoming, uh, the fullest human being you can opt to be, you know, uh, for for a life you have reason to value, and you go pursue that, and you have that ex freedom is is attached to that. So, if work were search for life, then uh, in this fullest sense of life of capabilities, emancipation is freedom uh, in the capabilities approach. There would be some equivalent. You know, if we follow that um, that uh, line of thinking, but if life were one of survival and existence in the barest sense, um, like a mammal in an animal kingdom, and there are many in this world who have that kind of life, can work be emancipatory? So again, you know, what are the conditions? Uh, subsistence activities like fishing, vegetable gardening, or even foraging in the forest uh, may not necessarily be officially counted as part of the production frontier, um, but that is the life that people have and have known for, for generations. What can we then say about that type of life? And also, how do they value the life that they live? So they may have their own judgment about the value of that life, and, and we have, because we're in this New York City, we're like, oh, poor them which may not necessarily be the case, right? So, so then that's why it is important for us to think about, well, what value or judgment we place about life itself? Uh, what makes it significant? What is its meaning? And so on. And I don't want to be new agey here, but, you know, <laughs> it's worth thinking about. <laughs> uh, um, so while we may not value this approach to life, many in Communities and villages around the world have always had this type of existence, and it is an existence that's connected to land and nature, and their being is aimed at harmony with nature, so that perhaps their worldview, uh, you know, it's not important to be part of the production boundary. Yeah. So, so it's it's. I'm just throwing that out there. And of course, we've already heard about women's work, in particular, the social obligations, the duties that we have to perform, that need to be fulfilled. Even though the modern world, again, may not consider this as work, as part of the production boundary, you know. So, um, but some many women actually find value in this caring activity because that is what they know. That's their consciousness. 
Is it that level of my identity and my, the meaning of my life comes from the caring of my family? Uh, indeed. But many women also, as have explained earlier, find emancipation in going to have professions or engaging in, in work, in jobs, hopefully not for survival, because one can also work for McDonald's and that's not necessarily, you know, that's a matter of survival. <laughs> Uh, you know, in the capitalist, capitalist world, of course. So again, I throw that out. What value, you know, are we placing uh, to life so that we can call uh, or think of life as a search, of work as a search for life? Um, <clears throat> now, in, actually, we need to think, go back to emancipation, and part of the history of emancipation is actually related to Karl Marx, whom no one has yet mentioned. Am I allowed that? <laughs> um, and the Marxian conception of emancipation is tied to the workers' relationships with social relations with capital. Now, it was already mentioned that socialist feminists have contended, you know, that these two are actually related. The caring work is tied to uh, capitalist production and capitalist relations, so that caring work is itself exploitative, and so the emancipation is now both emancipating oneself from the obligations as well as from capitalist production. But wh what I really like about the notion of emancipation from Marxian sense is really that emancipation is beyond the individual. So one can think of empowerment as an individual empowering oneself because I've educated myself, I'm, progr I'm seeing progress for myself, I'm more healthy and so on, but it's not in my view, emancipation, unless it is a social struggle, to confront the structures that limit all the possibilities um, that I might have or could have uh, to live a life that I have reason to value, Again, right? Because I'm placing meaning and significance to life. And in order for me to find work to be emancipating or to be a source of emancipation, I can't do it alone because the capitalist structures are there. In fact, I don't even have to be in a capitalist world. I may, it may be that I'm a fisher woman competing with capitalist <laughs> production. It doesn't matter what my, work, my social relations of work are. You know, um, what matters more is how we can all actually work together to, um, how do you say, just to, to confront the structural inequalities that place limits. We call these glass ceilings, we call this invisible walls, uh, we fall through the cracks, all, but all of that is structural. No matter how powerful you are as an individual, you'll never break that or change that. And so emancipation has a class component, if you like, from Marx. But I think in this modern world, we're really talking about mobilizing, organizing, um, the networks, the coalitions, the alliances. Uh, whether you're in high school from <laughs> Parkland, <laughs> Florida, marching today, or, or, you know, or is it social media, all of that is actually part of the emancipatory process. So we need to think about emancipation, uh, work as emancipation, can only truly be emancipation if that organizing and mobilizing was also part of your work, you know. Um, and that's how I'm kind of seeing this <laughs> question. Thank you. So work as emancipation or emancipation from work. Yes, please, to both. <laughs> uh, but I think the problem is how do we get the kind of work that's emancipatory and how do we not let work take over all our lives in, in the way that uh, Marina has uh, been uh, uh, eloquently uh, uh, cautioning against. So the phrase that we often used in Europe to talk about this is work-life balance and how do you secure that work-life balance. But let me backtrack a bit and then return to that at the end of my talk. I'm, I'm very struck by how we're coming to this question from our positioning. So I'm coming to this question from A, the experience in the UK of the decimation of the welfare state, the growing, the, the turning of what once were social rights into social policing with more and more onerous conditions uh, to get 
the kind of income transfers like unemployment benefit that were invented and experienced for a long time as social rights, which were not, there was no punitive side to this. You turn up once a week to say, yes, you're still unemployed and sign the paper and you get your money. And then you can uh, go home and start a pop group or um, uh, maybe start your own business or maybe study so that you would be better prepared to enter the labor market. That is all gone. So now we have a totally uh, punitive regime of, uh, in the welfare state, a big transformation, and also a big transformation of the labor market. Uh, so that the growth of precarious work and the erosion of the conditions uh, uh, in uh, the public sector that once actually provided quite a lot of decent work for women uh, the, in the kind of uh, uh, care and education and health professions that Julie and others have turned to. So we're facing a crisis of the kind of work that we've got. And we're also facing a, um, a push, uh, Shara mentions single parents, um, most of whom are women, although there are some men, and let's acknowledge them. But again, a huge push in the way our welfare state in the UK has been reconfig reconfigured uh, to make those parents take paid work. So first it was when your children are um, attending secondary school, you must take paid work. Now, then it was when your children reach the age of seven, they must take paid work. Now it's when your children start the primary school, they must take paid work. And more and more, when they're age three, maybe you should be taking paid work in a very um, a punitive way. Uh, you know, um, the, the um, uh, mothers of, uh, the, the partnered mothers of middle class uh, people, of course, it would be nice for them to stay at home and take care of their children. But if you're a, a poor single parent, uh, then all the pressure is on you in order to receive any of these um, welfare benefits uh, to find a job in this increasingly precarious and punitive labor market. So the uh, low income uh, people are working very, very long hours. And that struggle for the eight hour day, <laughs> which was so important in the 19th century, is going to have to be waged all over again. So th that's one context. The other is the work in international development that I do, where Anshara has uh, referred to that, and Marina too, where there's all this uh, s very one-sided, I put it this way, one-sided pressure on increasing female labor force participation. And increasing la female labor force participation is seen as an unequivocal good. And the IMF now, uh, in its um, Article 4 discussions with countries, that don't have very high female labor force participation rates is putting in the agreements indicators about uh, that they should be increasing their uh, female labor force participation rates and monitoring uh, to see if they do. Um, and, uh, and this is talked about in very poly Pollyanna-ish terms as if there's no question that women entering the labor market is, uh, of course it's good for growth, they say, and it's also good for women without any discussion of what kind of work it is and what are the distribution of the, of the uh, profits from that work. And I go along and say, look, female labor force participation is going up. The data shows that income inequality is rising. There's this concentration of wealth in the hands of the, the 1%. I mean, surely this means that the distribution of the benefits from female participation in the labor market going up is very, very skewed. Shouldn't you be doing some studies of this? Let's have more indicators of the job quality. Let's have more indicators of the distribution of the benefits, but not only this single-minded focus on female labor force participation, as, as you know, oh, great, it's gone up, and oh dear, what's happening in India? Because it's not gone up in the way that it should which is not to say there are no problems uh, in uh, the situation of uh, women in relation to both paid and unpaid work in India, and people here who know more about that than I do, um, but it is this very single-minded notion 
that um, it, it must only be a, a good thing if female labour force participation is rising, and this will be also good for the growth of the country, without really any investigation of what kind of employment is being created and how, what's the distribution of the benefits. At the same, it's gone along, of course, with until very recently, a big push for deregulation of labour markets in the name of efficiency and a big attack on collective organisations of uh, um, both of um, uh, wage workers and of self-employed people. So it's in that context, I think, that uh, I'm, I'm approaching this question and thinking, first of all, I like that word emancipation because that connects us, I think, with long history of struggles for freedom from servitude. Um, but I think Marina mentioned Marx, and I think we probably should on the 150th anniversary of the publication of Capital. I mean, one of the great lessons of reading Capital is that you, um, you have to look beyond legal for, uh, forms to see if people are emancipated from servitude or not. You have to look at the economic forms to see whether they're emancipated from um, uh, servitude or not. So even if it looks like they're free to choose, even if there is no forced labor, even if there is no slavery, the dull compulsion of economic forces may really circumscribe the nature of that freedom to choose that they have. So it's a very skewed, distorted, limited, tiny little uh, choice uh, that they might have. Um, but I think one of the, and, and, and Julie quite rightly said, we have to think about work and what do we mean by that. Um, and I think one of the contributions that feminists have made is A, to, um, to broaden that understanding of what work is. So it's not just paid work, it's unpaid work. And to understand its complexities, you know, both its, its positive and its negative aspects. Um, but also to define what work is effort, but it's effort that's um, other directed. I spend a lot of effort hiking or playing sport or playing music or something, but that's not counted by economists, feminist economists too, as work. It's, it's activities, that effort that's other directed, that's doing something for others or with others that's work. And when it's for others or with others, that always raises the question of what are the kind of social relations under which this work is done? Are they ones of servitude or are they emancipatory? And I think we've always been concerned about, is this women's dilemma? Um, uh, to escape one kind of servitude in unpaid work, do we have to embrace another kind of servitude in paid work? And um, Shara referred to the work that Ruth Pearson and I were doing, actually it's almost 40 years ago now, we were actually working on this, uh, trying to refuse a binary distinction between oh, it's great that more women are going into the labour market, or, or it's all, or bad that more women are going into the labour market, to talk about, which I think is still valid today, the, the decomposition of the existing forms of women's subordination, particularly familial forms that uh, Shara has talked about, but the recomposition of new forms of subordination. And one of the forms we actually mentioned was the, uh, the issue of sexual harassment in the workplace. You know, new salience today that you might be less, um, you might have more freedom within the family, but within the workplace, place you are going to be subject to new uh, pressures upon you. And so I'm always keen to have that kind of dialectical approach when we're thinking about work, both paid and unpaid work, and the extent to which it does or doesn't emancipate us. And I also want to bring in a, a concept. Um, which is starting to be used more now, a concept of depletion of people's energies, uh, their self, their resources, um, their, uh, uh, their, their morale. I think we, I first introduced this concept in the, in the, the first edition of the, uh, what's now the UN Women Progress of the World's Women, a little bit of an afterthought when we were thinking about the impacts of structural adjustment uh, on uh, low-income women and how somehow it was expected they could fill in all the gaps that were left by not 
having clean water or well-functioning health clinics and at the same time do more paid work and as well you know women's women's uh, capacities are not infinitely elastic and there'll come a point where their their health their strength their very being is depleted and i left it at that but since that concept then that concept was taken up by Shirin Rai at Warwick University, who elaborated it more conceptually. And it's been used more recently uh, by the group of researchers at the Institute of Development Studies in the University of Sussex in some of the um, case uh, st study work they've been doing, I think, in Nepal, in uh, an, another African country, Uganda, I think, maybe where they've, they've gone along with small-scale surveys to discuss uh, with low-income women about their, the full spectrum of their work, the paid work, the unpaid work, and its implications for their health, their strength, how many hours can they sleep, uh, what kind of injuries have they had, uh, what's the state of their mental health, and so forth. And that really does come up with evidence about how this, this too much work of the wrong kind uh, it depletes women, depletes men, of course, who are also in that circumstance of having to do too much of the wrong kind of work. So I think we definitely want to avoid that kind of work that's depleting, because that's not emancipatory. So I think that the, the question is, if we want both work that's emancipatory and also um, uh, to be emancipated from spending all of our time on work, what, what are the kind of um, what are the kind of things we need to do? And I think members of the panel have already mentioned quite a lot of these, so I will just um, just pick up perhaps four things. One is definitely the reduction of drudgery. So, okay, here in New York, you can turn the switch to get the electricity, turn the tap to get the water, but that isn't so uh, for low-income women in many, many parts of the world, so that investment to reduce the drudgery involved in the not having the energy, the water and the sanitation infrastructure is really important. The backbreaking aspects of the work. Um, then um, I think there is, uh, uh, let me say something about social protection. I think social protection or social security as we call it in Europe, social protection is this UN word I had to learn. Um, the welfare state, income transfers of various kinds. I do think that is a very important, there's a very important set of um, uh, processes there for um, helping us with that work-life balance, with the work that's emancipatory, but also the emancipation from work. But when we think of so, uh, social protection, actually it's quite broad. It involves public services as well as income transfers. Um, and so I think it's always important to have the, that balance. It's not just the one or the other. You need the public services. Mm -hmm. And I know this, one of the <laughs> Julie's concerns is, OK, if we only go for the income transfers, what happens to the actual provision, say, of care services? So you, you always need that balance, I think, between the, the decent work in uh, accessible public services. But I still I think there's a place for income transfers, too. And interestingly enough, the discussion our basic income is very, very different in Northern Europe than it is here. Of course, uh, it's conce conceived in, U in Northern Europe as not a kind of replacement for work or a replacement for public services, but as maybe a better way of doing the income transfer system that we've got, given the way that that has now become a strategy for policing poor people in many contexts. So the government in Scotland, which is a pretty progressive government is very actively pursuing um, kind of um, pilot studies, if you like, in what would it happen if we had a basic income to replace some of the welfare benefits that we've got in particular cities. So I do know that basic income means very, very different things in different contexts. And, and so I was very struck um, by what uh, Julie said about, oh, wow, that's interesting, because it's like a bit different in the way that it's understood and the context in which it's coming into in a country which has got a lot of public services and uh, still a welfare state, even if it's deteriorated a lot. 
But the final thing I wanted to talk about was collective action, uh, because I think really in order to get that work that's emancipatory, but also emancipation from work, so we've got some spare time, so we can come to panels in the evening <laughs> and enjoy some, in, some discussion. I think there's no substitute for, for collective action. And actually, that's a point that Ruth and I made in our work long ago, that the real gains that women are going to get out of doing work that is, in many ways, onerous, that is low paid and so forth, it always depend on what kind of collective action they can take and the benefits they can get both personally and collectively through being part of an organization. So it's quite heartening to see in areas of work that we didn't, that we thought were hard to organize, that traditionally haven't been organized. Um, we see women now coming together to organize uh, paid domestic work. There's a good case in many parts of the world, paid domestic workers coming together to organize getting an ILO convention passed, using that ILO convention as a kind of entry point to, to organize uh, for, for a whole range of things, including time off. Uh, so I, I, I think I'll, I'll end on that uh, point, both emancipatory work and also emancipation from work. Thank you to all our panelists for a very thought-provoking, uh, for very various thought-provoking discussions. Uh, before we open up for questions, I'd just like to ask the panel uh, one question and use my executive privilege. Uh, so it seems, unfortunately, we've converged on the idea that we are not going to abandon work, mm -hmm. and we are not all going to strike tomorrow and stop working. But uh, you know, we're going to retain some redefined and renewed idea of work. And all the panelists have pointed to different uh, ways and means to make work more emancipatory, from you know, re-regulating the labor market to greater income transfer schemes, uh, social protection, uh, better work-life balance, uh, more equality, more income equality. Uh, so I was wondering if the panel can perhaps uh, reflect on whether they see any particular opportunities, avenues, openings at, the, at this present uh, moment. Uh, that can be used to advance our goals? I, 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 to advance our goals is, is very, um, I feel it's quite ambitious. <laughs> no, um, so I'm trying to think of where the opportunities are, and that's really the challenge right now. Um, just today, I, um, today and yesterday, I came from a meeting where um, um, international uh, non-government organizations from around about uh, 10 or 12, a dozen of them from different parts of the world have agreed to form a coalition, uh, what they call the Gender and Trade Coalition. Uh, and some of them are here uh, uh, just today um, because they were reacting to how the World Trade Organization, for example, has decided that they were going to actually promote women's economic empowerment as well uh, through the various trade rules that they're negotiating right now. I mean, it's not yet at the negotiation stage, but you know, one needs to be very careful about how these conversations start because they might actually um, go, go into negotiations, which can be a very scary thing. Now, more than 10 years ago, we at the International Gender and Trade Network thought we were fighting to get gender onto the agenda. Now they're talking gender and it's not exactly <laughs> the kind of conversation we want to have. So yes, some progress, uh, but we can't, again, you know, we go back to collective action and we can't stop um, working at the issues um, that are on the table being negotiated. Otherwise, other people will set the rules and we will not be the ones um, expressing our views, our um, values um, onto the uh, negotiation table, neg negotiating tables. And so that's where, that's one area where there's actually movement um, and we're hoping that this will be pursued um, in the future. But, you know, Diane also spoke about the International Domestic Workers Federation, which um, I'm actually supporting um, as a grantee. Um, so there are organizations who have taken the norms, the global norms, and are bringing it down to the national level, seeking ratification. It's a very tough and difficult fight. 
uh, for domestic workers, if you can't get a day off, when do you organize? When do you have your union meetings if you can't get a day off? So it, it's not actually a simple matter. No, but they have to see this as an opportunity to organize. So no matter how difficult a situation may be, you need to find those ways. And, and, and so opportunity is how you will have to define that uh, and, and move together so that um, again, <laughs> organizing, mobilizing, so that you can achieve um, uh, your, your social goals. So that's a couple of examples of that. Um, I would say, you know, there are a number of things, despite generally, the, obviously, the global environment we're, we're in is not a very, is not one that inspires a lot of hope. Um, so we all share that sort of being depressed about where the world is going. But there are a few glimmers. I mean, one of the things I see is that there is in at least, there is greater appreciation, I think, for the fact in many Asian countries now with falling fertility rates, Japan, South Korea, others have actually done quite a lot in terms of their worries maybe about the low fertility rates and why women are not having babies. But there is a realization that part of that has to do maybe because women don't want to be doing all of this unpaid care work with little you know, solidarity from their partners and there are very few services to support them. And actually countries like Japan and Korea have done a lot in terms of putting in place provisions for elderly care, for child care. Um, in in you know, many sort of high income countries as well, the issue of population aging is a really important issue that is drawing attention more to the need for having making investments in care services. I think these issues are on the public agenda and you know in the media in a way that they were not there before. And at the same time, I think also this uh, concern about environmental limits and the production of too many goods and the fact that that kind of employment has uh, negative implications in terms of environmental sustainability. Now, if you really make the care sector where your jobs are going to be created, that is a green sector. Producing, providing care is investments in human capabilities. It's not producing goods, and it doesn't produce the kinds of pollution and the kind of carbon footprints that production of goods produces. So in a way, I think those two things come together quite nicely to make investments in the care sector an attractive um, uh, proposal. Um, so that combined with the fact that we are seeing more organization of domestic workers, of um, community care workers, I think those things together, for me at least, it provides some glimmers of hope and, and making, making care an issue that can fly, uh, both from an economic kind of job creating uh, side as well as from uh, sort of meeting human needs and investing in human capabilities side. So maybe that is an opportunity. So um, a, a couple of things. One follows on from what Shara just said. Um, I was rung up by Justin Trudeau two or three weeks ago to say, would I be on some G7 gender equality advisory council that he's set up for this year while well, Canada has the presidency of the G7? Well, I'd already, I knew this was coming and I'd consulted with some Canadian feminists. So in the end, I decided to say yes. And there's a subgroup that I said I would join, which is, I try and remember, it's about investing in growth that benefits everyone. Because this is one of the themes that the G7 countries has already said that they're going to work on. So my, I think that's an opening for me to push this issue of investment in what we in the UK call the social infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the care care for everybody who needs it, you know, care for children, care for elderly people, care for people living with long-term illnesses and disabilities. The points that Julie made about uh, pro providing decent employment in the care sector. So I'm going to try and take that opportunity. So anybody who's got any useful studies, data and so forth that I can feed into this to say we, okay, you're talking about investing in growth that benefits everyone, you should be investing in the care sector. And the second one, and perhaps but might be particularly of interest to people at the New School, I think there are avenues opening up at the moment to advance the goal in terms of greater collaboration 
between uh, people working on human rights and heterodox economists. And I'm sitting here opposite my co-author on some of this, Radhika Balakrishnan. Now, in terms of what we're thinking about, we want um, work that's emancipatory and also emancipation from work. You look at the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and it has some pretty good guideposts uh, for what that would mean in terms of rights to work, but also rights at work, and including a uh, right to leisure. Um, and I think certainly there's a lot of interest among um, NGOs, among uh, lawyers, uh, among people in the UN human rights system who are working on economic and social rights to work more closely with progressive economists and draw upon their insights. We just need more of a response now, I think, from the progressive economists. So it's not just me and Radhika and James. <laughs> so I'd like to invite you know, colleagues at the New School uh, to might be interested in, in joining this venture, thinking how can we reframe economic policies away from a utilitarian focus uh, into uh, one that first reflects on the principles of human rights and says, does this policy comply with human rights? And if it doesn't, sorry, forget it. Now, this policy might comply with human rights, and so might that one. So then, yes, we can use some of our usual tools to think about of these two human rights compliant policies, which might be more effective. But we've, we've narrowed the choice set, so that it's only those policies that are human rights compliant. And I think it, on t in terms of spelling out what does emancipatory work look like and also what does freedom from work look like, the, the, human, right, that, that the human rights conventions, to, together with the ILO conventions, is a quite a good starting point. Uh, the problem, of course, is organizing to achieve that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it took me a little while to think of glimmers of hope, you know, as, as a U.S. citizen and, you know, uh, voter these days. Um, I, there are some sexual harassers who have been taken down, okay, you know, so, so you know, this is, this has finally happened. Um, I have to say, I also take a, a, a glimmer of hope about, um, you know, make it, making an economy that serves, serves people, <laughs> right? Uh, that I think um, among more left-leaning economists and even center and even kind of center-right economists, there's long been an idea that the economy just kind of runs as its own and then the government has to be the actor that corrects things. Um, and if we're waiting for that right now, we're in really bad shape um, in the U.S. And I think there might be, you know, a little bit of a sign of the, the, the waking giants um, that some companies now have realized that there are lines that they can't cross. Um, uh, NRA, you know, the NRA, Charlottesville, some other things, you know, business councils re resigning, the rest of that. And this isn't to say I expect, you know, the business sector to ride in on a, a white horse, but I do think a lot of the problems we're facing, labor problems, problems of sexism, environmental problems, are not going to be solved unless we have all hands on deck. And I think getting out of this thinking that the economy is this machine that does its own thing and then the government has to do all the action, I think is one of the barriers to us all mobilizing to get a more human economy. Great. Thank you all very much. We're open for questions and we can take a few to start off with. Can we have a mic going around? Thanks. Maybe. People over there stand up and yell because I can't see you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Anne Marie Gutz from NYU. And uh, first of all, it's like a drink of water listening to you five. Uh, you've all made such amazing contributions um, to labor economics and household economics and uh, social protection. So thank you. It was a wonderful panel. Um, I have three questions. The first one was actually about the spatial dimensions of work when we're thinking about work as freedom and the political dimensions, which I'm not sure either were mentioned that much, but when it comes to women, women's emancipation isn't the place where work happens terribly important. And um, this whole issue of isolation in the private sphere, which of course a lot of economies are pushing people to home-based work, which is usually very welcome. You can combine care and, 
and uh, you know wage employment. Um, but of course, power wants us to stare at screens and get soft and be isolated and not be in community and not discover solidarities through shared struggle. Um, and so to me, that's a giant concern. It affects men too, of course, who are working um, at home. Um, and um, I just worry about that, just not only in terms from a gender perspective, but also even from a democratic perspective, what happens to democracies as people are more and more isolated. Just a, just a thought, um, which is relevant to the discussion of work as freedom. Um, then th that was just a thought. I'd welcome your reflections and two specific questions. I'm wondering about um, the the relationship. I mean, the, your, everybody spoke about this: the relationship between gender inequality and work. Um, women's engagement in the la paid labor force, I thought, has stagnated since 2000, and it's gone down in the U.S. and a couple of other important places. Um, and um, I, Diane, you mentioned um, income inequality and how it's got this dynamic of um, you know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer under the current sort of um, capitalist system and structures. And I'm wondering, as, women, um, as women's engagement in the paid labor force stagnates or drops, are we to expect an intensification of gender inequality? Um, and I'm thinking about this in terms of the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, which has loads of problems, I know, but uh, this year said that the gap is getting bigger almost everywhere, but in particular in the US, and that globally the gap in um, economic um, uh, sort of uh, yeah, rights and, and income is going to take 217 years at current rates to close, but that's a lot more than last year, so it's just like a giant increase. So I'm wondering about that. And then finally, um, I was so happy, Shara, to hear you reference this sort of strange win-win scenario that McKinsey projects and, you know, dozens of trillions of dollars will be added to the economy if only all women work, which, which is part of this kind of punitive narrative of, oh, women are so lazy, you got to lean in, you got to try harder, you got to work, and you're going to benefit and the world's going to benefit. And I'm, and, you know, you wonder, I'm not an economist, that's obvious, I'm sure, but um, where are all these jobs that women are going to take? In what kind of economies are you imagining um, that aren't obviously going to be suffering from, you know, loss of jobs from, uh, you know, robotification or whatever? And also, we know already very well if you're going to be taking a job that a man thinks he ought to have had, the violence that follows is pretty extreme. So where's the calculation of e economies changing in that way? My questions were too long. I'm sorry, I stopped. <laughs> And as we have only about half an hour, so uh, humble request to keep your questions brief, please. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Krishna. I'm a graduate student at Maxwell School in Syracuse. And as a graduate student who is just starting out uh, doing her work, I find conversations, s some of these conversations very difficult, and I wanted to ask the panel for tips to navigate these conversations. So specifically, uh, so I work with, uh, I work on women's work in agriculture in South Asia. And when I'm doing my work, two of the contexts in which I have the most difficulties uh, expressing that, you know, like uh, what the panel discussed about how paid work for women, you cannot look at it using a binary lens, whether it's emancipating or whether you know it's doing the opposite of that. And having those conversations with women who I'm working with or with government officials who I'm working with are often very difficult. So like, any tips for navigating these conversations with people who might not necessarily be in the rooms like these or people who are outside of context settings like these? Thank you. We can take one more. Sorry, uh, my name is Jenna, I'm a graduate student here. And so my question was, um, we, you guys talked a lot about like finding ways to make those opportunities happen, but I remember recently just reading an article about um, companies not wanting to hire women now because of the whole like Me Too movement that has come up because people are afraid that women are gonna say something or women are gonna accuse someone of something that may not have happened. And so it seems almost like by empowering women to speak out, um, to try and 
get rid of the sexual harassment problem, it almost like caused another inequality by now saying, well, we don't want to hire women. So it's kind of how do we balance that and what does that look like? Um, just taking that last one first, um, totally illegal. <laughs> Not that there's going to be a whole lot of enforcement of that right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there, I think one should always remember to have, you know, procedures of due process, but the exaggeration of the idea, I mean, it's like the, the, um, the, the, the narrative about massive voter fraud, you know, the narrative about massive false accusations of sexual harassment, they just, they don't hold up statistically or any, any other way. Um, I think that, um, you know, if, if we waited till, till everybody said okay when we made demands, we'd be waiting a very long time. And I think demanding sexual harassment free workplaces is just something that has to, has to be done. Maybe I'll just um, pick up the McKinsey point that Anne-Marie mentioned. Not only doesn't McKinsey say, you know, um, I mean, we've heard a lot about these spates of jobless growth and where these jobs are that women are supposed to take and who's going to be doing the kind of Keynesian stimulation of the economy that creates jobs. That's a big question. Also, another thing that the McKinsey calculations don't capture is the fact that very often a lot of these women have a lot of unpaid care and unpaid other kinds of unpaid sort of social reproductive work. And if there is this big shift and female labor force participation is supposed to go up by whatever they say is, has to go up. What's going to happen to all of that work? If women take both, then you get the depletion and the exhaustion and everything else that comes with it. And if they just drop their kids and go, who's going to pick up the cost of that and who's going to do that? So it's a very one-sided calculation, which I think is deeply problematic. Um, yeah, um, Anne-Marie, um, I. I take your point on isolation, but actually what I'm more worried about is, is the scrutiny on migration. You know, I think the, the way we have become very restrictive about um, migration rules, um, and I'm not just talking about the <laughs> United States, myself, a potential victim of that. Uh, <laughs> I could lose my job anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I think what's more worrisome is, is this demographic you know, it's, a, it's humans move, right? But we don't like it. So we want humans to stay within these borders, real or imagined. And, but hey, I'm all good for free trade. I'm fine with foreign direct investment, financial flows, uh, you know, and yes, inclusive growth and all that, because that's what I'm after. But please do not you know, people stay there. <laughs> Don't go anywhere, right? And and this is a, a very strange uh, setup. This this regulation of um, stopping people from moving and actually taking advantage of where opportunities are. It may not necessarily be an income, you know, gap that they're after. It may actually be for education, for pra to practice their professions, or or but for most of people, they need to stay alive. For most people, there's a lot, there's a huge group of movement there that's about staying alive. This is about survival. And we're telling them, no, stay in the war zone. You, you know, we'll send you aid. Well, I, I mean, this is, this is uh, how can we, I, like I was saying earlier, if we talk about work and emancipation, but we restrict opportunities, uh, where, 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 where is that going to lead us? Huh? Right? Um, and where does that lead, leave those people, actually, that we have decided what their opportunities are going to be? Because our borders are whatever, you know, again, real or imagined, because borders are always movable. But, but this is my question. I'm not worried so much about the isolation, really. I, I think that it's this, these uh, regulations. There's an ongoing conversation on the Global Compact for safe and orderly um, um, migration. Um, and you can see the number two objective is to make sure people stay within their countries. And then all the other objectives are about, OK, we can't do anything about that. You've managed to move. Let's figure out how to make it a safe and orderly movement. 
you know, but so it's not even a compact on migration, it's a more a compact on you please stay where you are, right? So that's more worrisome for me. Um, and I think uh, uh, Anne-Marie was, was also asking about the, the organization, the collective organization of home-based workers. So it definitely it's more of a challenge, but it's not impossible. If you look at the work of Uyghur, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, they have lots of examples in their network of uh, ways in which home-based workers have organized. And we see other self-employed Workers certainly in London, the Uber drivers are organising and claiming that they their conditions of work are such that they're not really self-employed. They're employees, and they should get the rights of employees. So, even under quite unpromising circumstances, I think we do see some uh, uh, examples of collective um, organisation. Where are the jobs? Excellent question. And actually, at a, at a workshop we had uh, that Anu said works on women's economic empowerment at UN Women, organized in Berlin in February that several of us were at. And this is one of the big headline things. Get them to stop talking about and measuring women's fema female labor force participation. Let's look at employment rates. because And don't just keep telling us, oh, well, there's no data on that. We've only got the participation rates. Because it, it completely masks the fact OK, you may be getting more women, in some sense, into the labor market, but there aren't the jobs there for them to do. Uh, so I think that's always a good question to ask, where, where are the jobs? And of course, it's a question which heterodox economists have, <laughs> have got lots to say about. So looking at the demand side as well as the supply side. And in fact, you look at India, where there's been all of this um, worry about female labor force participation. And a lot of the work was focused on the supply side, you know, maybe there are these cultural barriers which are stopping. But actually, the latest work says it's on the demand side, is because the jobs are uh, being created in the places where women are available for the work. Um, and talking, you, you asked a question about talking in your field work, I guess it was, was it? Talking with, with women and with officials. Um, it's it's always important to, to sort of talk with women first about you know how do they see the situation, what do they want, and it may not be what you think they ought to want, <laughs> but you, then you have to understand the constraints. Again, at this workshop in uh, Berlin, we heard about some research that um, Naila Kabir and James Heinz were doing uh, with uh, women home-based workers in Bangladesh. She said actually they preferred to be home-based workers, because if they went out to work, they would be more vulnerable to things like sexual harassment. So then, OK, that's what they want right now. So maybe we start where they are. We think about how can they be helped to be organized. And then we also say, and now we've also got to tackle these things like la lack of safe public transport, which is one of the reasons why women aren't going out. So I think it has to be a kind of serious of conversations, really, but which starts where women are. With the officials, well, yeah, you have to start where they are again. And but sometimes you have to tell them they're wrong, <laughs> and that the facts don't the facts don't support <laughs> what they're saying. And sort of trying, well, what, why do they think that? Because look, here's your evidence that shows something completely differently. So it can be challenging. And of course, if you're if you're um, a young woman researcher talking with male officials, there are also you know, additional uh, challenges uh, there to, uh, uh, to cope with. Um, and it's often these kind of conversations that go round and round like that rather than in straight directions. And I think the tr same is true of struggle. I think you asked about well, what do we do now? They're saying um, after the success or partial success of Me Too and anti-sexual harassment, are they not going to hire women because women are troublesome? It's the same, if we give maternity leave to women, we're not going to hire women because they have babies. And I think it's, you, if they raise the minimum wage, we're not going to hire workers because we have to pay them more. So there's always that extra bit of the struggle you then have to do. It's never completely won. You know, you, you mobilize the evidence, like Julie said, you tell them what the law is, and then you, you have to fight again uh, to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, so, so it's never completely won, I think. It's always that ongoing uh, 
collective struggle that's necessary. which I think is important, again, Anne-Marie raised it, this issue of men, you know, male backlash and in a, in a context where men are having problems, having jobs, and that certainly is an issue. Um, you know, Sylvia Chan's work um, uh, in Latin America, her research showing in contexts where men are losing jobs and don't have, cannot perform a breadwinner role that they think they should be, pro you know, provisioning their households. When in those house, when in those contexts, women are the ones who are, you know, finding some kind of work. Of course, you know, materially, that's what keeps the you know, their households afloat. But I think it does become a little bit of a very difficult context for women to be to be um, living in when it is very much the case that men are losing out. And, and that's not the best context within which to really think about gender equality. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's when things are going better for everyone that it's also much more easier for women to renegotiate roles and and uh, get a bit more room for maneuver even within within their families and households. So I think that is something of, of concern. It is something of concern in contexts where, you know, men men's roles are being breadwinning roles are being seriously eroded as well. More questions? Hi, um, I'm Faria Mohyuddin from the Tax Justice Network. Um, just picking up on what Diane said about the collaboration between human rights and heterodox economics. I mean, this is definitely a lens we can use to look at the impact of macroeconomic structures or policy, such as uh, tax regimes on women's rights. But as someone working in this area, I mean, we're here for UNCSW 62, it's incredibly difficult to mainstream this into uh, the gender rights discussions. So I, I'm kind of cheating and I'm going to ask the panel, any tips or tricks on how to do that, how to talk about that in those arenas? Thank you. Hi there, um, I'm Alison Holder from a new global partnership called Equal Measures 2030, um, and we're all about trying to ensure that data and evidence gets used to really fuel progress on gender equality. One of the things we're doing is developing a new um, gender index, and we're very keen to move beyond the concepts such as labor force participation for all the reasons talked about here tonight. But um, a lot of the best work on this is small scale studies or country specific, region specific studies. And so just any ideas from the panel on metrics or data or um, indicators that we can use that are available at the global level that will at least give a broader perspective on decent work and measuring progress on that. Thank you. Mm -mm. Thank you, Sarah Arat from University of Connecticut. Thank you for very interesting presentations. And I'll try to make my question quick, but I think the answer will be long. The, um, giving all uh, the earlier emphasis in the presentations on uh, social relations, production relations, negotiating with capitalism and all of that, what are we looking for? Are we trying to find solutions within capitalism, maybe from neoliberalism back to welfare capitalism, or are we looking for ways of transforming the system? Thank you. Hi there, my name is Raina Tu, and I'm from Make and Run Count. So, uh, we monitor African countries in terms of progresses they made. And uh, thank you so much for the wonderful panel. I think it was really interesting because the care worker is something that is quite left out when you talk about women economic empowerment and mainly in Africa as well is a really big issue. So um, I think there's a new evidence that some uh, company have been used having crash uh, Crash, that's French, sorry, have been having kind of nursery at work. It apparently has bear fruit. It shows that a lot of women were encouraged to come to work, but also it has really financially, I think, uh, increased, um, I don't know, the, how to say that, something about the company. So how do you think, because now you have been asked by Justin Trudeau to come on board of this women's committee, how do you think you could push those kind of policies that or the company could adopt because we could see it's bearing result, but I think not many people are really keen to adopt it. Thank you. Last 
Good evening. My name is Crystal Simeone with uh, Femnet, uh, based in Africa. We just came out of the regional meeting um, leading into the CSW, and we were talking about unpaid care work and quantify, quantifying it, valuing it, and recognizing it, um, and pushing that with governments. And Uganda came back to us and said, that's interesting, but we really don't want to include it in our GDP calculations because that drives up our GDP and then we go into a different income bracket as a country. Uh, I'm curious to know how to counter that because I'm struggling. Um, no, I just want to respond to the um, the social relations question. Um, I, I actually prefer not to think about capitalism only, because I think that all the modes of production are in, in existence in the world today. I mean, one can think of primitive accumulation in, in natural resources. Uh, I'm not sure the socialism exists. If you count Cuba, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but all modes of production are there. Feudal relations are present. Uh, with with uh, still some peasant farming going on in there, so it's not so much those, you know, the specifics of capitalism, right? Uh, yes, it's important because it's dominant and and you know it's taken on the imperial form. Absolutely, okay. But really, each of these modes of production, all of these modes of production, require human rights, require entitlements. Require, and that is the challenge. That's more interesting to me as a challenge, uh, as an economist. Now, do, do we want capitalism? Do we want feudalism? <laughs> That's a question that I think we leave to those who are actually directly engaged in those, uh, so uh, in the middle of these uh, social relations. Uh, you know, whether the peasants are actually going to organize and seek land reform is a question, again, that's a collective action question for them. Or um, the mining uh, co uh, communities, mining affected communities, what sorts of uh, ideas they have for broadly sharing the um, monopoly profits of, of, or at least <laughs> claiming a share of the monopoly profits of these mining companies. You know, I think that's where the real struggles really are. Um, this big question of um, the historical <laughs> movement uh, in, in, in the Martian sense, I've sort of kind of dropped away from that. Um, I mean, so, so right now for, for the immediate present, uh, immediate time, I'd rather see uh, human rights applied in each of all of these modes of production. That's my message. I have, a, I think, a similar response to the same thing. Right? Or rather than think about you know, capitalism versus some other system, I tend to think more about capitalisms. <laughs> I tend to be very suspicious of, of the big narrative, either the big narrative that capitalism is, and free markets create big wealth or capitalism creates unending exploitation. Both of those are, are big narratives that, that, that um, don't really work that well. I'm an empirical social scientist. I want to look around at the world and see what's uh, helping me explain. Um, I've also noticed you know, in a lot of acad academia um, over the last few decades, there's been a big narrative about neoliberal uh, policies. Well, I mean, Trump is now going protectionist, OK? It's weird. It's probably going to do a lot of damage, but it's not part of the neoliberal narrative. Um, so you got, we got to watch out for these trying to blanket and shoehorn everything into some story about um, Whenever I hear phrasings about impersonal power, um, I get suspicious. So maybe I'll just take the mic. Um, I also think there are varieties of capitalism. It's not you know one uniform form, and I kind of I know that you know social democracy and that sort of Nordic version of it um, maybe you know is a very historically specific one. But there are elements of it which require you know better regulation of markets. Um, higher taxation rates on corporations as well as high incomes to fund a universalistic kind of whatever we want to call it, welfare state, um, social policy, social provisions. Uh, I think those are some elements that this new, um, whatever the variety, whatever variety of 
capitalism or mixed economy that we want to have would need to include, as well as having enterprises that are, you know, there's a lot of experimentation around the world in sort of social economy, as they're called in Latin America, forms of production and uh, that are not necessarily uh, sort of directed and don't have the profit motive. And, and think about a kind of mixed economy that also includes other kinds of, you know, the cooperatives, other kinds of um, um, forms of production and um, labor relations. So, I mean, that would be where sort of I would like to think that we can go. Um, with a stronger role for the state in terms of regulation, tax and transfers, but not something that's very top down, but much more of a kind of that has definitely bottom up kind of elements to it and a state that's very responsive to the kind of needs from um, sort of collective voices, social voices um, of different kinds. And I want to pick on the question of what to do when the private sector kind of offers, you know, is or uh, is saying that they want to offer childcare services, because it's an issue that we um, also at UN Women kind of struggle with when we're told by IMF to partner with them and they want to push corporations to provide childcare services. And in a way, it's, I mean, I do want to think that childcare service provisioning. Ideally, it's something that it should be a public service because the problem with that is certain corporations can afford it and will do it for whatever reason, for PR reasons, but it becomes a very segmented system if you have childcare provision that is provided by some corporations and not others, whereas as a public service, it is something that all women, no matter what kind of, whether they're self-employed or whether they're working in small enterprises or whether they're agricultural laborers, you know, they would have access to it. So. Um, I, I, yeah, I think uh, I would like to think in terms of uh, a more kind of public system of provision of that kind of service um, rather than enterprise-based. And con uh, countries in Latin America that have tried the enterprise-based one have ended up with very segmented systems and a lot of people kind of go through the cracks and don't have any kind of service provisioning. <laughs> so I, I, I certainly <coughs> want to aim for transformation. But I think the kinds of transformations you can aim for, you fight where you stand. So you have to build out from where you are. And I've been hearing from the things that other people have been saying, you know, the issues that they're being engaged with. And then I think it's, how can that be transformative? So I agree with Shara about the, limit, the limitations of embracing the company crashes as the way of getting more childcare, because I don't think it's transformative in the way that we would like to see, and it locks you into that particular employer, because you're gonna lose your childcare if you, if you move from that employer. So it, it kind of weakens your bargaining power, and it doesn't create the idea that um, support for childcare is, is a social good that the whole, uh, a country should be supporting. So I would say, I understand, you know, when it's difficult and they come along and say, we'll do this, the, the attractions of that, but I'd say, think of how transformative it is and it's not transformative enough, I think. And actually, I think we have to be, care of this, be, be aware of the same problem if we're thinking about um, the valuation of unpaid work in terms of putting a shadow price on it. Um, and do we want to argue that should be uh, included in the GDP? Simply doing that is not really transformative, I think. And I can understand why governments say that they don't want to do that. And so you can always argue they should have what we call um, a satellite account alongside it, which uh, can, can have, and some countries do have this satellite account alongside the, the GDP. But I think what's more important is actually to, is getting the recognition of the importance of that unpaid work, thinking about particular policies. So in terms of like investment in care infrastructure, so having the time use data is really actually, I think, more important. So you can show how much time uh, men and women, but primarily women and girls and boys too, primarily girls, spending on this unpaid work. In what ways does it constrain them in, in terms of depleting their resources themselves, their health and strength, preventing them from doing other things? And then when we're bringing in measures like, oh, we're going to improve the efficiency of the health service, so now we're going to have 
um, a move to day surgery, and this is really going to improve productivity because, look, the patient only has to go to the hospital in the morning, and they, they don't stay in overnight. They're released um, uh, at the end of the day, and look, it's cost less because we don't have to pay those doctors and nurses and hospital staff. Yes, but somebody, some friend, some relative, and I've just done this recently, has to go collect that person from the hospital, has to stay with them, has to make them, well, in the UK, we have to make them cups of tea. <laughs> you have to monitor, is their temperature going up? If it does, call this number, and so forth. Uh, and you ha and generally have to care for them, make them feel uh, that they're loved and cared for. No, that doesn't figure in anybody's account books even though people may have to take time from their paid work, because I'm retired, I wasn't taking time from my paid work, but it was still an expenditure of effort. So, so I think bringing to attention that what looks like a productivity increase or an increase in efficiency may simply be just transferring costs uh, from where it shows up to where it doesn't, is, is might be a more effective way. I'm also thinking, We've got more and more of this time use data, which is great, but how can we bring it to bear in relation to specific policies in ways that's more transformative? And I think the countries where they've, even when, the, I think like maybe Norway and Finland have got these satellite accounts, but when you talk to uh, women there, they say, well, actually, we don't use that very much <laughs> in the policy discussion. What we focus on is the time use data. But it, the reason where it would be important is to show to McKinsey, yeah. to show to McKinsey, you're assuming there's zero opportunity cost. <laughs> but actually, you see, if you move all these women over into what shows up in GDP, this other account is going to fall. So there it would be useful, and that's really to make a polemical point about they've done their calculations in a really stupid yeah. way. But otherwise, I think focusing on the actual time use and how you can bring that to bear in relation to specific policies might be more productive. The data and evidence on decent work, uh, it's not my area of expertise. I mean, I'd start with the ILO as having people who, especially if you want a global look, what have they been able to put together? And Shara knows a lot about these kinds of issues as well. Um, I'd be careful about doing an index. I'm very allergic now to more, to more indices because the problem is you get composite index, you've always got the problem of weighting the components, and even, so this country does very well and this country does very badly, but does it do well across all the components? Does this one do badly across all the components? What does that tell us about the policy changes we want to see? So I'd, I you know, encourage you to think more of what I think of as a dashboard, where you have these different components, and you, then you say, oh, they do well on this, but they don't do very well on that. <laughs> Uh, and on the, the tax justice issue, and this is certainly something that uh, I've been uh, very concerned about. And sometimes I think um, it's like, how do you convey it to people that's, so that it doesn't seem too technical and off-putting? So in the UK, one of the things we found is to kind of, if you can produce some <coughs> figures about the tax giveaway or the tax loss, and you say, we're losing all this, there's a tax giveaway which is benefiting this particular group. How much is that costing the government? What, if they'd spent it on care services, what could we have had instead? And when it's evasion and avoidance, I mean, I know it's more difficult to come up with the calculations, but there are estimates of how much do countries lose in evasion and avoidance. But then to translate that into what could we do with that money instead makes it more directly related, I think, to women's rights issues and the issues of service provision. I mean, it's really great that you're working on this and that more and more organizations are taking up the idea of tax justice as a women's rights issue. But I think it, and sometimes you might have to think of hypothecation. All this extra money we might get if our dreams came true and there was a reduction in avoidance and evasion, let's put it into a hypothecation hypothecated fund and say so we're then going to use that for investing in care or whatever else it is we want to invest in. Great. I'm afraid we're out of time, but uh, thank you to all our wonderful panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, and sharing their thoughts with us. 
thank you to all of you uh, who came and participated this evening. And in closing, I would also like to thank my dear colleague and co-organizer, Sakiko Fukudapar, uh, our assistant director of administration, Bianca Rogers, for her very efficient and helpful uh, arranging and organizing of this event, uh, as well as her helpers, Emma Pulido and Monica Salman Gomez. Thank you all very much.